Okay, picking up where we left off, we're on page 240. We're talking about the, the different types of, of techniques for allocating IP addresses using DHCP. So we talked about the fully automatic mode, which is kind of weird. Manual mode, which requires you to record the MAC address of all your machines, but it does provide some good results. And then last, it's what's called the dynamic mode. And the dynamic mode is probably the way it comes out of the box which means I'm going to issue a, a temporary lease to whoever asks for it, and uh, they're just gonna expire and I'll just renew. Okay, that's probably right out of the box, that's what that thing does. Now, you use dynamic, for example, in those scenarios where I'm, I'm running out of IP addresses. That scenario I told you about if you had 200 machines, but for some weird reason, only 100 of them were operational at any one time, your pool of addresses could be 100 because the only way that would work would be the dynamic one where you had a very short lease um, and then the machines would uh, just trade off IP addresses. They would hot bunk, so to speak, the IP addresses. And once again, the dynamic still tries to kind of hold things together. If, if, it, if you have an expiration date, I mean, that's really short, it's gonna try its darndest to give you the same one over again. And there's several, there's a, like a seven minute warning and a five minute warning and then oh my god we're out you know several little tries before the before the expiration is out to to try to get you to renew so that you don't have any interruption in service okay now i'm going to talk about some different things here uh that's not in the book so there's some other issues you can get done with dhcp there's an awful lot of information that could be provided to your machine well in, in, in advance of what we talked about. So I'm gonna pop over to the Wikipedia page talking about, so here are the, the ones, the, the types of information that was originally set up. I wanna provide you my sub, sub, subnet mass, the, the time set, that's cool because you know we could be at different time zones. Where the router is, where the time server is, where the domain server is, where the name server, blah, 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 blah. So, all this kind of interesting, this is what they originally had thought about. Domain name, things of that nature. And then they opened the doors to whoever wanted to put anything in the world in DHCP. Weird stuff. All this other, you know, MTUs and broadcasts. And then they kind of just went crazy about, you know, NetBIOS and X Windows and on and on and on. So, in this particular case, there's about a hundred or so extra little codes that you can throw in here to provide all sorts of other information. So your DHCP server could provide the big three, the IP address, the subnet mask, and the default router, mostly including in that, so I guess the big four would be the DNS server. Uh, that's what mine does. It doesn't provide anything else, but I'm just telling you that there's an awful lot of other things out there that could be provided with your DHCP. So um, how do I protect myself? Let's go back to this little diagram here. How do I protect myself from a rogue DHCP server? Let's say, for example, that um, I, um, I've got a laptop and uh, I'm, I'm gonna sneak into some company somewhere. I'm gonna jack it into a live network connection, like maybe in a conference room someplace. And I'm gonna set up my own DHCP server, it, just inside this little laptop, and so that any machine who asks is gonna say, hey, who wants to be my DHCP server? My laptop is gonna answer, I will, I will, I will. Okay, see the scenario now? So back to here. Um, a client could get multiple offers. He, he sends out a broadcast and could get multiple offers. And if the machines are, are not configured in a secure environment, whoever answers first is typically the one who's gonna get the, gonna get the rest of the, the DHCP requests to happen. So how is this bad? Well, it's bad because I could slip you a, a separate DNS, we haven't even talked about dynamic, uh, the host, the name protocol thing, the DNS part. Um, but I could slip you a bad one of those. And so that when you typed in the, the name of your bank, instead of going to your bank, you actually went to my website over here. That's all I'd have to do is just slip you a bad DNS server 
And then whenever you would talk to whatever your bank is, you weren't actually talking to your bank, you're actually talking to my machine and you'd never know it. Okay, so this is a big thing, right? So if I go in and put a DHCP server, a, a rogue DHCP server in your network, I could really, really wreak havoc. Okay, so how do you protect against that? Well, to tell you the truth, it's a little difficult. They tried to actually harden the, the client piece to make sure that this was a respectable machine. You know, you could pass certificates back and forth, but again, this is early on um, a machine booting up, and so some machines might have the oomph to be able to pull that off, but you know, maybe my phone doesn't. You know, it doesn't have that much oomph to be able to tell, you know, whether or not this is a legitimate uh, DHCP server or not, because it's kind of a, you know, wimpy kind of environment. So. How you do that? Well, the real answer is intrusion detection, okay? Where you put system, you put a system in your network that basically listens for rogue things to happen. Okay. All right. So um, what happens if I, there is no DHCP server? It's, it's down for maintenance. And so I turn on my machine and it goes through this, hey, who wants to be my DHCP server? And nobody responds. What happens then? Does the machine just say, oh, well, what the hell? I guess I'll just wait. Is that what it does? No. It gets provided its own address. There's a thing out there called the automatic private address, a PIPA, if you automatic private address, IP address. Okay. Anyway, the idea is there's a, a range of addresses that are automatically assigned. So if you have a machine that's not connected, to uh you know you just have two machines in a in a room with you know connected together it's not connected to the internet at all and there's no dcp server there's no dns server there's no server of any type it's just you two machines in a, in a conference room hooked together they're going to automatically assign their own ip addresses cool and it's in the range of 169.254 that's the address range where the machines basically say well i didn't get a request I mean, I didn't ever get a valid offer from my DHCP, so I'm just going to do my own thing. Okay. Which brings us on page 250, 242 to this whole concept of the private addresses. Okay, a private address. Inside the, the IP address space, remember we talked about the class A's and B's and C's and all the rest of that stuff. Inside the, each, one of, each one of those classes, there's a sliver of class A addresses that are designed to be private. And a private address basically means this is an address that does not have to be unique. All the rest of them have to be unique, but not these guys. These, you can have as many of these guys as you want. So for example, in my house, in this machine right here, I'm gonna bring up that IP config thing one more time. Okay, so my IP address is 10.0.2.2.15. That is a private address, meaning that there could be any number of machines. There could be thousands of machines on the, on the internet, right? This very second with that exact same address. We'll talk about the magic of how that happens a little later, but right now we're just concentrating on the address spaces. So, Let's go through some of this. Now, some of these address spaces, you're going you're gonna to recognize the numbers, most likely. If you're a geek, you'll, remember, you'll recognize these numbers. If you're not a geek, that's okay. All right. The first one is 10. The 10 dot whatever addresses are all private addresses. Okay. Most, a lot of people are familiar with the 10 dots. And the other one is 192.168. A lot of people go, oh, yeah, I recognize that. So 192.168 is a group of 256 class C addresses all put together. By the way, the book is wrong. They call it a class B, but what the heck? The book's always wrong. And then there's a third one in the class B range. That's 172.16 to 172.31. And I don't see that very often. And, and uh, a lot of people would not recognize that as a private address. Okay. So now we're gonna actually talk about what that actually does. So there's a, a system out there called NAT, which is Network Address Translation. And basically what it does, uh, it 
it allows me to have, use private addresses inside my network. And then whenever a packet leaves my network, it automatically gets translated into a valid routable IP. So right now, that's my IP, right? 10 0 2 Let me go to someplace like what's my IP. And let's see what it says my IP is. This is a cool place out there called, you know, what's my IP. Dot net, I believe. Okay, and it says my IP address is 70. Well, wait a minute. Which one is right? Is it 10.0.2.15 or is it 70? Well, they're both right. What NAT does, NAT allows me to use this number inside my network, but as soon as I send the packet out, it uses this address. Okay? Okay. That's basically how that thing works. All right, there's a, a, a picture here of how this thing works. So inside my house, like for example, my router gets 192.168.2.1, and so my machine has a 2.3, and you know my laptop's got a 2.2, but whenever I leave, I get a completely different address space. So it translates. So all three of these gets translated into one natted real IP. It's not like a one-to-one -one relationship. So NAT was one of the first things they used to solve the problem of running out of IP addresses because remember we had a problem with IP of V4 address space where theoretically it has four billion addresses, but in reality, due to some crazy way they allocated them. There's about 600 million active addresses that were actually being able to be used. So when we ran out of address spaces, Time Warner doesn't have to give me 12 IP addresses. I, I've got 12 devices, not all on at the same time, but give me a break. I have 12 devices, but uh, they don't have to provide me with 12 addresses. They just provide me one address, and then I use NAT inside to get the 12 that I want and when I whenever it leaves the internet I mean leaves towards the internet then it gets magically converted okay so one more time the private addresses never leave the local network okay that remember the title of this section of, of the book is non routable addresses okay so I can't be can't route those guys so the router is doing the responsibility to switch between the, the fake IP and the real IP, you know, going out and coming back in. It has to be able to do that itself. Cool. Um, they kind of go into explaining how this thing works, and I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds, but basically what they're saying is, you know, I have an address over here of 192.68.2.2, and it gets translated to, to this, whatever that is, 65.34. To 2670 and then on the way back it says okay I want to send to 70 and then it goes oh I know what that is I remember that and so it says okay that's 2.2 so it just switches them back and forth back and forth between the fake and the real fake and the real and it basically has to have port numbers because in this scenario there's only one machine doing the talking but if there had been two machines in here doing the talking then the the rat the the NAT would actually have to include more information about how to get from here to here. It have to include the port number to match up. So this little table here, this NAT forwarding table, talks about you know before and after, old and new, in and out. That's how to get that done. Okay, cool. So one more time, Time Warner only provides me one IP address, but I can essentially have practically any number of IP addresses that I want as long as I use NAT. Okay, cool. That is good enough and we'll uh, stop right there and pick this thing up again in just a few.